It's time for ROTD Weekend. One of the things I love most about this podcast and that I love most in life is when I get to learn new things. And that happens a lot on here on the weekend edition of the show when I have guests on who are experts in a certain area. What I love even more than that, though, is when I learn something that I thought I knew and then kind of realize I didn't. And that is what happened this week when I talked with cookbook author Emily Parrish. Her book is called From Fermenting Made Simple. And as I was sitting down to just sort of think about the questions I wanted to ask, I realized that I wasn't sure to phrase them because I thought I knew what fermenting was, but it turns out I didn't really. And I was kind of confusing it with canning. And maybe I just have absolutely no idea what it is at all. Have I even ever done it before? I kind of thought I had, and then I thought maybe I haven't. And so this conversation with Emily is really fantastic because, well, I think I just sort of lay it on the line and say, I don't actually know know anything about this. And I say that more than once. And she really took me by the hand and explained it so well. I know you are going to love this conversation that I had with Emily. Her book is award-winning. It has won the Gourmand World Cookbook Award, and it is nominated for a 2023 Taste Canada Award. It is really that good. And she truly is the expert on fermenting. And I cannot wait for you to hear this. Hey, Emily, welcome to the show. Hi. It is great to have you here. Now, I know that you are a fermenting expert, and I also know that I don't know almost anything about fermenting. And as I was sitting down to come up with questions for you, I realized that I was thinking about fermenting as though it was the same as canning, and then had this realization like 10 minutes before we started talking, like, oh, wait a minute, those are not the same thing. So could you tell me what is fermenting and how is it different from just what I think of as canning? That's a great question, Christine. Most of the time when people are canning, they pack stuff into a jar, they put it in their canner, they bring it up to a boil, and the goal of canning is to pasteurize it, basically kill any yeast, bacteria, mold that might be in the food so that you can stick it on your shelf and leave it for a really long time. Most of the time, people can higher acid foods or use sugar for preservation, so jams and pickles. Mm -hmm. Fermenting, well, is an entirely different umbrella. Uh, You already know a lot of fermented foods. I think you're talking about fermented vegetables when you talk about canning, but you know, yogurt, every loaf of bread ever, even if it's not sourdough, is officially fermented because yeast is part of that all your beer and wine. Fermenting is huge. It's like a bigger umbrella. It's a way of preparing food that changes the sugars, the proteins through the use of microorganisms. In terms of vegetables, when you're making fermented pickles versus canning pickles, they don't actually start with acidity in the jar. You pack the jar with your cucumbers, You typically are using salt to encourage lactobacteria to acidify the sugars in the pickles. So they end up actually being quite sour, like it had been packed in vinegar, but it's through this lactic acid bacteria fermenting that causes the acidity. So that's how that's done. And you know what? It actually is as shelf stable as canning. Um, You don't have to refrigerate after a week. If, if, if it's fermented happily for a week or two on your shelf, it will ferment happily for like six months. When I do pickles, which I actually just happen to have made this weekend, I don't expect to be eating those until May, June, when I'll finish them off. And they can just sit in my cupboard. And they're very similar in that it's using acidity to preserve the food. Mm-hmm. One way you're using vinegar with fermenting, you're using lactic acid bacteria, which have acidified the foods. Okay. And so, okay. So this is, I I guess in my head, I know this, like I know yogurt is fermented, kombucha is fermented, wine is fermented, pickles are fermented, but I guess I, I just don't understand how those things are all the same. And I think you were just explaining it, but can you maybe break it down just a little bit more for me? Like what exactly is going on and how is this preserving things? 
Okay. So there's a bunch of different ways food can be fermented. I think technically anything that is using a microorganism to change the nature of food is in a way that is still edible, not (laughs) rotting, which is the same, but with the wrong kinds of bacteria and yeast is um, fermenting. So there's bacterial fermentation, which is yogurt. When you mentioned yogurt, Mm -hmm. it's actually part of what is going on with kombucha. It's what is happening in pickles. Mm -hmm. Then there's yeast fermentation, which is also in kombucha. Kombucha has both. Your bread, your wine, beer is yeast. Mm -hmm. There's also mold fermenting, which is miso, tempeh, tends to be something that most people aren't as engaged with. But if anybody out there listening to the show likes fermenting and is interested in mold, I highly recommend trying miso. It's very easy and reliable. I love it. Um, So those are the main ways of fermenting. And then why do you ferment food or why should people be fermenting food? Like what is the reason? Is it just because it tastes great? It's preserving a little bit? Is Is there another reason? So a lot of people get into fermenting because they want to improve their gut health or improve their health. Traditionally, all food preservation involved fermenting. Even vinegar is made through a fermentation process, which is what we now use to replace fermenting in our canned goods. So I totally love it because for me, it's a lot easier to pack a jar of fermented pickles than to can them. I actually have been doing a lot of preserving because it is summer. So last night we canned traditional style where you put them in the canner and boil them for 25 minutes, cherries. But I also put up several jars of fermented cherries. And both of these will last in my cupboard for a year. I will say putting up the fermented cherries, so much easier. Like canning, you pack them into the jar, you put in the liquid and and everything. And then with uh, fermenting, I just shut the lid and stick them in my cupboard. With canning, I have to put them in the canner, bring it up to a boil, boil for 25 minutes, move them from the canner. Now they're on my counter waiting the 24 hours for the lid to set. Like it's actually quite a bit more work. So I like fermenting because it's easier. Sorry, I can tell you have a question. <laughs> I, have, I have so many questions. Okay. I, I feel I, do, I feel actually really dense all of a sudden. Like, so you don't have to boil anything. So it's, you're just putting the cherries with the liquid in there. And then how, how are they safe to eat without the canning process? I guess in my head somewhere, I thought that you were going to be fermenting, like packing it as though to can it. And the stuff inside would also be fermenting. Does that make sense? You understand where I'm like, but you're saying you're just something completely different that I'm just not, it's not sinking in for some reason. It's totally fair. So (laughs) this week I did cherries and pickles. So when I did the fermented pickles, I used salt. So I put it in with the salt brine and Mm -hmm. the salt will ensure that only bacteria can live in my pickles. So no mold or yeast, because in a pickle, I don't want it to be yeasty, um, can live in my pickles. And they will ferment with just the lactic bacteria. So I don't need to heat it. If I heat it, I actually kill the lactic bacteria. With the cherries, I chose to do a honey ferment, which is something I have on my blog, but it's also in my cookbook. And I did a few different concentrations of honey because I actually Mm -hmm. wanted to experiment with different concentrations of honey. Mm -hmm. And the honey, raw honey, has yeast and bacteria. So it will ferment with yeast and bacteria. So these cherries will be preserved Mm -hmm. in a different way. Mm -hmm. The reason why I chose to can some as well is because when you ferment with um, yeast and bacteria, it always ends up more acidic. And I wanted some sweet cherries that I could just pull from the cupboard and serve right away. Mm -hmm. So the fermented cherries will be lovely, delicious, but they won't be sweet. So even though one of the jars I packed in straight honey, so it's just straight raw honey and cherries, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by the time I eat it, it will be tart. Yes. Okay. So now now I want to ask about things that I've done before and you tell me fermenting or not fermenting. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Okay. So I've done like preserved lemons. So I've just taken lemons and packed them with like tons of salt. I think that's pretty much what I did in a jar and left them for a while. Were they fermenting or just preserving? So 
I personally also struggle with this idea of if you use too much salt, does it stop the fermentation? So yes, that is true. Salt-packed foods are not always fermented. It depends on how much salt you used for your lemons. I think it was a lot of salt. Yeah. yeah so salt packing is not fermenting. Okay. And then what my, my, my mother-in-law, our former mother-in-law, I guess, I used to make with her, it was like a German thing. I think it was called like Rumtoff, something like that. It's like fruits you add throughout the summer season at different times. And at each time, like you start with the strawberries maybe, and you add sugar and rum till they're covered. And then in this like sealed container, or maybe there was like plastic wrap and then like a lid. And then the next time that something's in season, whatever berries it is, whatever fruit it is, you keep adding to that and then you leave it and then you eat it in the winter over ice cream. Is that fermenting? It depends on how much alcohol you use because alcohol also will stop fermentation. But mm -hmm. if it was bubbly while you packed it, then it was probably fermented. So most fruit has natural yeast. Mm -hmm. If you mix fruit with sugar and leave it on your counter, it will ferment. I don't recommend that your listeners do that without <laughs> knowing what they're doing because I have a very experimental friend and he does a lot of this and it's sort of 50-50 whether it works out. You know, like if you know what you're doing, which is what I recommend, then you're sure of your culture, it'll always work out. But if you're just like, let's just throw sugar in these berries and see what happens, 50-50. <laughs> so yeah, follow, follow a reputable uh, uh, cookbook your cookbook, yes. for instance. Exactly. Why don't you, you know what, that's a great segue. Why don't you tell us it came out in the States last year, but more recently in Canada. And I would love for you to tell us about it. So I wrote Fermenting Made Simple for people like my sister. And I keep using her as the example. So she works full time, has two kids, but loves the idea of eating healthy food and doing home prepared food. It's just really complicated for her to do that most of the time. And I've been trying to convince her fermenting is actually really simple. Like she does really complicated dishes on the weekend, but I'm like, you don't have to do that. You could pack up a jar of kimchi and then it's so easy to add it to your dinners throughout the week. So that was the goal behind Fermenting Made Simple. I wanted to make it for people who, who want to be healthy but aren't necessarily already taking the plunge to making their own sourdough. So it covers everything that most basic fermenting cookbooks would cover, but from a perspective that is simple. So none of it requires specialized tools or ingredients. I know my sourdough method probably drives the perfectionists crazy because sourdough has quite this cult following about weighing all the ingredients. And I'm like, no, you can just do this. It will work out. And, and that is truly my belief. Like I am not a perfectionist mm -hmm. by any means. And so that is really what I wanted to help people with when I wrote this cookbook, to feel the confidence that they need to be able to try fermenting, especially given that it seems like this sort of exclusive club of people who are either like extremely hippie or very hipster or health related. It, it really isn't. It's something that farmers were doing in the Middle Ages without any running water. And they, you know, this is how they preserve food. We can do it too. It's it's quite simple. I, that's, that's really beautiful, actually. And I think like, you're taking something that sounds so complicated and just bringing it down to simple. And I, I'm thinking about what you were just saying about your experimental friend. I'm guessing or I'm hearing somewhere in there that you're saying that's the crazy stuff that some crazy people can do or you can go all out with that. But if you just follow this simple method, follow my simple way that I've tested, you will end up with a great product, right? Exactly. So I do think a lot of people are afraid of trying to ferment something because they're like, what if I kill my family, you know, or what if I waste a lot of ingredients? So yes, these recipes are all tested at least three times. I actually, that was three times by me as written. And then I also got what I call beta readers. So people who had never fermented before, my sister included, to do it in their homes. My mm -hmm. sister didn't even have any specialized, like normal canning jars. She's never canned anything. So she was packing her pickled vegetables into like pasta sauce jars and <laughs> she didn't have any failures. So <laughs> that was the goal and it worked out. 
can you tell if it has failed? Is it obvious? Like, cause I think that that is maybe something that I would worry about too. Like, okay, I've done this thing. I can tell you that I, I don't, this was not fermenting, but I tried making Gravlax once a long time ago myself. So salmon insult, and then it just smelled weird. And I'm like, I don't know if it's supposed to smell weird. So we just didn't eat it. But like, is there going to be a way to know? Yeah, I think smelling weird fish would put me <laughs> off too. <laughs> So the number one way most fermented foods go off is with a mold that you don't expect. Like unless it's miso, you shouldn't have fuzzy mold on top. So really the other bacteria and yeast are not going to cause it to rot. But I guess if you open your jar of pickles and it smells really bad, don't eat it. Generally, most fermented foods don't smell bad at all. They might smell yeasty. Mm -hmm. um, if you put cauliflower or, or something like stinky like that in it, it might smell a bit like cooked cauliflower, you know, that sort of funky yeah, yeah. smell. Happy. But um, otherwise, yeah, it should smell good. It should look good. There shouldn't be any mold and it will be fine. I'm trying to think, like, I've been doing this for a long time, and I haven't had a ton of failures. Mm -hmm. So that's part of what gave me the confidence mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to do this. So mm -hmm. yeah. And then, and you don't sterilize, so you don't need special jars, and you don't sterilize the jars first or anything like that? I do sanitize. Uh -huh. um, sterilize is a lot of work. But okay. I sanitize, if I'm packing things up for months that are just not going to be refrigerated, I pour boiling water into my jars and let them sit for five minutes. Mm -hmm. And that pretty much kills all surface bacteria, yeast, and mold. However, if I was making yogurt, I don't sanitize my jars. I know that they'll sit out on my counter for six hours and then they'll be in the fridge and they'll be fine. I don't sanitize for things like bread, like when I'm doing sourdough. I do sanitize for wine and, and beer and cheese. And I use sanitation chemicals for those because funky beer really sucks. <laughs> so there you go. Now you mentioned early on that people are interested in fermenting because of health benefits, gut health. Can you talk a little bit about what those benefits are? What What is that about? Sure. There's tons of research on the health benefits of fermented foods. So I'm not going to delve into it right here. My book covers some of them. My website covers others, mostly because it's such a huge list. However, I will tell you why I started fermenting. So I had a ruptured appendix when I was in my 20s. And by the time I was operated on like I was quite sick and I had to have tons of antibiotics. And fast forward 10 years later, I had tons of food intolerances, tons of health issues, like a lot of different problems. And then I also, my kids were having health issues and I was in my doctor's office. Like my son had been to the allergist and, and my daughter was just a baby and we were, we'd already been referred to a dietitian because she'd had such bad reactions to the food we'd introduced to her too. And I was like, what am I going to do? And it was my doctor who suggested we try fermented foods mm -hmm. to improve our health. And so I was like, that's where the blog came out of Fermenting for Foodies. It was 2014. And there, well, there was some books out there, like I love Sandra Katz's book, but it didn't feel very accessible or like something I was going to be able to convince my kids to eat necessarily. So I decided to create a blog and just sort of blog our year of eating fermented foods. And that's where it started. And within the year, our health was so much better. Like I went from feeling tired and sacked out all the time to having a lot more energy, just overall good health. Mm -hmm. If you have um, digestive issues, like my son's allergies, like ones that he had like a letter from the allergist, which allowed us to go into events and stuff like that, bringing our own food because he literally couldn't eat most foods. Mm -hmm. um, he has either outgrown them or improved so he can eat pretty much everything. I'm not fully there yet, but I hope to be in the future. It helps with eczema. So that was another thing my kids had was pretty bad eczema. It even helps with mood issues and like anxiety. It can help with calming anxiety. 
So basically, there are tons of bacteria and yeast and microorganisms in our body, whether you're eating fermented foods or not. And the goal with eating fermented foods is to cultivate the ones that have historically been part of our lives. So all bread was sourdough. So having a sourdough starter in your house is simply like cultivating the cultures that you want to have. That is fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing your story along that as well. That's really helpful to know, like, it's not just, oh, I'll feel better, but that it's actually helped you and your family. That's really great. So for anybody listening who wants to try fermenting, whether for health or for taste or just because it's a super fun project, where can they find you? Where can they find your book? So my book is Fermenting Made Simple should be available to order if it's not already in all of your favorite local bookstores, of course, online retailers as well. You're welcome to request it in libraries. I'm I'm not sure if all libraries are currently carrying it, but they definitely can order them. And my website is fermentingforfoodies.com. And there I share all different kinds of fermenting recipes and I'm constantly adding new ones. The book is a bit different. If you're really into it, I recommend using the book because it breaks everything down in an easy to use format for flipping back and forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, The website has a lot of the similar concepts, but it's, again, it's a website. So you'd have to be delving and Mm -hmm. looking around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes so much sense. Well, thank you so much, Emily. This has been fantastic. All right. Thank you. So yeah, I'm feeling pretty humbled. Fermenting is not quite what I thought it was and also exactly what I thought it was. I'm not entirely sure, but I am obsessed with Emily's book. You have got to check it out. If you head to her website, fermentingforfoodies.com, you can get to the cookbook from there, or I will put a link in the show notes for this podcast episode to her award-winning book, Fermenting Made Simple. I hope you learned a lot. I definitely did. And now let's turn to what is going on in my cooking world. I am super excited about what I'm cooking this week in the test kitchen. I'm actually revisiting those tri-tip sandwiches I told you about because as I did more and more research, I realized that a lot of people use a particular seasoning blend when making this. And so I've actually bought some different brands of the seasoning blend and I'm trying to replicate it. So I am doing a Santa Maria tri-tip seasoning blend. That way you can make these sandwiches at home without having to buy anything special. I'm hoping to make it from seasonings that I already have at home. I am also reshooting the pictures for the Chuck Eye steaks on Cook the Story. When I did that post, the steaks in the store were quite thin and I was never super happy with how those pictures turned out because they don't look like the Chuck Eye steaks that I usually buy. And so I am reshooting those pictures. I got my hands on some nice thick Chuck Eye steaks and I'm doing that And I'm going to actually also, I think, take a video for TikTok and Instagram showing how you can use a wooden skewer to hold the steaks together because they kind of fall apart in weird ways. Super tender, juicy, wonderful grilling steak and way less expensive than a lot of other cuts, probably because of this falling apart phenomenon. But if you know how to cook them, they're wonderful. So I want to reshoot those pictures. And I was thinking, since I'm grilling up some steaks anyhow, I am also going to put my recipe for steak quesadillas on the site. I make these all the time and the recipe is just not on there. So I will be making those steak quesadillas with that chuck eye steak and then shooting pictures for that and putting it on the website. I know there's a lot going on in my test kitchen this week, right? I think it's because I hired this wonderful person. Her name is Jennifer and she has been coming over to help me and she like reads my mind and is washing things and handing me things just as I need them. It's been wonderful and I'm even more excited than ever to get in there and cook with her. We are also doing some corn tortilla quesadillas. So I didn't know that people didn't know this, but I was talking to my friend Cheryl the other day. Sorry, Cheryl, I'm calling you out, but maybe nobody knows this. I don't know. And she was asking me how I make my quesadillas. And I started off by saying, you know what? I like them best with corn tortillas, but my kids like flour tortillas. And she was like, wait, I didn't know that you can make quesadillas with corn tortillas. And I was like, oh my God, they're so good. They get so crispy and crunchy and amazing. And then she was like, I need to have this. And then I made them for her. And then she tried them. And then she's like, oh my God. And so now I'm doing a corn tortilla quesadilla to put 
on the site. That'll be somewhere in the same timeline as those steak quesadillas for sure. And if we have time, I have the ingredients to do some sheet pan shrimp fajitas. This is something that I make for my family and often make when nobody's home because I could just take the vegetable ingredients that I want, peppers, onions, tomatoes, whatever it is. Sometimes I do cauliflower, broccoli on there. I put that on a sheet pan all tossed with oil and seasonings. And then I just get a bag of frozen shrimp that have already been like peeled, deveined, and I just dump those frozen shrimp right on there. I season the shrimp and then the shrimp are on one side of the pan and the veggies are on the other side of the pan and I put them in the oven and the shrimp thaw and then they cook in the time that it takes the vegetables to cook and then if I need to, I'll put on the broiler for a bit just to get a little char going on. It's so, so hands-off and delicious and easy and so if I have time this week, I'm also going to do a round of official testing of that recipe because I'm sure you understand. It's different when I'm just like hanging out with Marty in the kitchen and having a glass of wine and throwing things on a pan and not writing anything down. That's not recipe creation. That's not recipe development. Surely, if you remember me talking to Jill last week, that is not what she does when developing recipes either. So, of course, I have these things that I make all the time, but then when I decide that it is time to put them on the site, I need to actually do it during the day and write it out and be careful and then test it again and make sure it's wonderful so that when you try it, it is as delicious as it is when I make it at my house you know? So those are all the things I hope to be cooking this week. As to what is going on to the site, there is just one new recipe going up on each website this week. That tri-tip marinade that I was telling you about, that is going up on the Cookful this week, along with a really great video showing you how to do a water vacuum at home when you want to get all the air out of a zip top bag to freeze things. I have a little video showing you how to do that if you don't know how to do that already. And on Cook the Store, the how to grill tri-tip is going up this week. So those are the new recipes you'll see there for recipe of the day for this podcast. I will be back again tomorrow morning and every day after that. This week, I am kicking things off tomorrow with the episode on how to cook tri-tip and how to cut it. So you're getting that. Finally, I've got some instant pot colored greens coming your way. I am celebrating sneak zucchini onto your neighbor's porch day. Yes, that is a thing every year. So there will be a zucchini recipe. There's some Italian chicken breast, some shredded beef, and a really delicious Mexican shrimp cocktail. All of that is coming on Recipe of the Day this week. Make sure you are subscribed to the podcast so that you don't miss any episodes. You can subscribe by searching for Recipe of the Day wherever you listen to podcasts or go to cookthestory.com slash R-O-T-D and you can subscribe there. You can also see all of the episodes that we've done there. There are over 675 of them now. So if you want some things to cook and you want to listen to me talk about them, subscribe to the podcast and you will see them all there and you will get the new one in your podcast feed every single day. Two on Saturdays because I do this one Saturday afternoons where I talk to an amazing guest from the culinary world. I hope you loved my conversation with Emily today. Emily, thank you so much for being such an amazing guest and teaching me so much. Guys, check out her book, Fermenting Made Simple. The link is in the podcast notes for you there or head to Amazon and search for it. You'll find it. I want to say thank you so much for listening. And if you are subscribed on Apple Podcasts, make sure you leave a comment and a rating. That helps other people find this show. You can also share it on your social media anywhere. Share that page, cookthestory.com slash R-O-T-D, and all the cooking lovers in your life can listen along with you. I'm Christine Pittman from cookthestory.com, thecookful.com, the all-new chicken cookbook, and from this podcast, Recipe of the Day. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Let's get cooking. 